uh, strategic partnerships at Big Cabal Media. I am the one that haunted um, Osahon down and asked and made a very compelling arguments for why Echo Bank should be on the Jollof Road trip. Um, I'm very good at compelling arguments and finding ways that um, partnerships between Tech Cabal Zikoko or our Cabal Creative um, element uh, can work and mutual satisfaction for all parties. So that's what I do. <laughs> Great, great. Thanks, Chidi. And, and Fuad? Um, hi, Osama. Um, okay, so I work as head of content at Big Cabal. That is, uh, my job is to figure out how we can consistently make ridiculous things um, across, for all kinds of audiences, across like Tech Cabal, which is obviously the tech and um, business of technology audience. Um, and Zikoko, which is just obsessed about youth culture. Um, so yeah, I think Chidi already said most of it, uh, but let me also add that um, Zikoko, and, Zikoko and Tech about very interestingly, are mostly like primarily driven by audience needs. Um, it's like, what, do, what does the audience care about? What is important to the audience at this point in time? And we just figure out the most effective ways to serve them the content in as many formats as possible. Um, so yeah, that is that is kind of the summary of how we think about content that think about. That's interesting. So as a publisher and digital media agency, you must have a lot of interesting insights into the population. What are some of the key trends young people are defining across Africa today? Okay, okay. I'm, going um, start, I'm going to start one. Yeah. Throw you under the bus. Um, I think and you can stop presenting. If, if it's no, no longer it's no, um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, make uh, some I'm going to talk about some things on the screen. So a lot okay. of the way we think about content has been driven by um, some of the trends that we've seen on Zikoko, especially. What we do is group content by the trends that we've seen. So we have something called money, a money category, because lots of people are interested um, with what to do with money, how to increase their spending, where to invest the money that they're making, how to make money from uh, people not in Africa. Um, so there's money. There's also things about travel and food. Food is a big, <laughs> very big component of what people care about um, on the continent, and which is why Jollof Road was such a big hit because it combined love of travel and food and just seeing how um, Africans across um, West Africa eat, basically. Um, so there's that. Obviously, there's music. Um, I'm trying to say there's also things to do with coitus. But I don't know if we're supposed to talk about that on an Echo Bank channel, but that's very big as well. Um, and then also, you know, just relationships and how um, to relationships of all kinds, growing with your parents, um, figuring out that you're now an adult and you have responsibilities, things like that. So those are the bigger trends. And that's how we've categorized most of our uh, content, basically. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Fouad? Yeah, um, so to add to that, um, you, you can say that the summary of how um, the most consistent trends across like Africa with young people is that, of course, obviously they are premium with youth, but there is also this restlessness. Is this general want for more? Like, um, we want to earn more, we want more out of life. Uh, we understand that we are trapped in Africa with all of its limitations, but we still want more out of life. And um, what you would expect from young people across um, the continent is that um, you find them making the most of the space they have and trying to get the most of the entire world from the space they are. And that's why you see that um, a lot of the shopping is happening off the continent. A lot of the subscriptions are happening off the continent because Africa is now just a location, but it is not where people feel like they only belong, right? Africa is a part of, of, uh, of the the world of young people today, most people, young people today, um, and I think, and I think that in a way shapes even how we think about content, right? We know that um, we know that Nigerian, like young Africans, everywhere no longer compare their local culture and the local experiences in the context of oh, okay, this is fine in X location. It's now like oh, how does this match up against the rest of the world? Um, so you could say that every brand in Africa is not competing against other African brands, they are competing against the world, 
for the attention and the and how to satisfy young Africans. So yeah. Interesting. Very, very interesting. I was um, smiling when I heard Chidi talking about food and travel and combining them. These are two of my favorite uh, topics. Personally, I love to travel. I've been to over 40 countries, 15 of them in Africa. I feel it's the best education you can get. Now, I like can you tell us? You said what? I said I'm envious of your passport. Oh, uh, the sort thing has taken a beating. Uh, <laughs> so tell us, how do young Nigerians decide to meet their peers across West Africa? Is travel within Africa popular amongst you, or do they prefer to travel outside the continent? That's kind of a tricky question, isn't it? I know the want to travel is there. The the wanting to travel and go to other African countries is definitely a thing that we have seen uh, pop up time and time again on social media, um, even when people were asking uh, the details of our trip. But the ability to is a bit more difficult and it's outside the reach of young Nigerians sometimes. Like traveling, traveling is expensive um, and we're dealing with people that would just like to get up and go. Um, the the logistics of it all is a bit is a bit daunting sometimes and so when people see that we would just rather pack up and go to Europe for example it's not because the wants to travel in Africa is not there it's more about the structure and logistics of it all and just figuring out there's not enough news about sorting out things from payments to where you're going to stay to fun activities that happen across Africa meanwhile you can just do a real quick Google search and you know what's going to happen on the 24th of September in Minneapolis, for, for example. <laughs> um, not as detailed in Africa. Um, that's, that's the way I see it, Fuad. Yeah, um, I, I am to, to add to that, I think that a lot of, um, there's a price problem and there's a perception problem. Um, it's that um, we, we generally just know, we know more about Minneapolis, like Chidi said, than we know about WIDA or Monrovia, right? Um, and that's because there's a culture of documenting like um, in like many other parts of the world. Um, so I think I think a huge problem that exists for people is that we don't even know where to go locally. And th that, that was like a question that Jello could attend attended to answer because even we did not entirely know all the places to go, we had to go and figure it out, right? Um, there's also the thing of price. Um, so people people want um, the nice holidays, but they can't get enough time off work. They can't afford to even travel like outside the con like outside the continent. And that's why you see that um, I'll use Nigeria specifically. There's this there's a huge culture of Nigerians on their long weekends. So let's say um, you have two pu two weekday public holidays plus two weekend days. We just drive to the Republic, spend the long weekend there. Whenever they take leaves, because it, it kind it, it's, it's kind of like a, a cheaper version of what people regard as a conventional holiday, right? Um, so so it is growing and it holds a lot of promise. But um, I think that what to make it like grow more rapidly is fixing the logistic problem that you mentioned. There's a price problem um, that we, we also know that like for young Africans, like um, credit is a problem, right? When they, anytime we want to pay for anything, we have to pay all at once, right? Unlike um, out um, more advanced economies where you can actually now like um, get like maybe loans or even like their plans to fix that problem for you. Um, and then there is, is also just the information, like where should people go? So yeah, mm -hmm. logistics, price, and just information. Okay, very interesting. So yeah. you know. This continent, Africa, has a very youthful population. The median age is something like 19.5. And companies seeking to achieve scale in the region need to engage the youth, right? Or else, you, you, you know, when you think about the addressable population, the majority of them are below 20. So um, for those who have joined today and are seeking to market products and services to the youth across Africa, what advice can you share about how to engage this population and keep their interest in a brand? Ask them what they want. <laughs> um, I think lots of people, um, the way I've heard quote unquote the olds speak about young people, and when we say young people, I mean, depending on who you ask, 35 is young people and down, and for some other people, I don't know, 
25 is where you, you your cut off mark is. But the way we do content, even uh, for Zikoko especially, is we ask our audience, like, what do you want to read? What do you want to listen to? What is interesting to you? We're always having surveys at some point, and that informs a lot of the content that goes out. Like today, we launched a new content line, and that's because repeatedly in all the things we've asked people about, they've asked about this content line. Um, and so um, I think financial services and anybody else thinking about engaging with younger people um, should stop seeing them as like lab rats. You know, it's like, hmm, I'll just observe them and see what I can glean, as opposed to just just asking they're they're grown they know what they like and they're not a monolith right so there's people i mean from i know we're going to talk about this later but we have a series called nara life and what we see is even within a specific age group there's people earning all sorts of salaries across all grades and so if you're thinking i'm going to just make a youth product you might be missing out either the top um top or bottom half of people because I mean there's people earning in dollars now from the comfort of their houses in Lagos um, Accra and Monrovia and the products you are like making have to then fit into their lifestyle you can't just sit back and be like mm, let me just observe I think so my biggest answer would be actually speaking to them as actual human beings instead of as lab participants I guess yeah. <laughs> interesting one. What? <laughs> yeah, so another, another interesting thing that is becoming more mainstream is that people like quality is no longer just a measure of how people choose the brands that they engage with. It is no longer just about quality. It is now how do like how do the values of this company align with my values as an individual, right? Um, and you see that people people like brands that understand their problems. People like brands that, like people who choose a brand that is not perfect, but is very empathetic over a perfect brand that has no personality. Time and time again, right? Um, so I, I think that, um, I, I, I think it's especially hard for some brands, for brands that were mostly, um, that, that have been established for a long time, to readjust to this new culture change and expectation. But um, if your audience cares about certain holidays, caring about that, ho that holiday is not making a poster and saying that, oh yeah, um, welcome, um, happy something, happy that, right? It is also just, it is also just being there for them when they need you to be there for them. That's cool. Very interesting. Uh so why would a young person try a product and choose to either stick with it or reject it? What are the key elements that for brands in Africa to consider when they're engaging? I'm going to let Fouad start on this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so, um, so for, for example, I, I think that, um, I think that like personal aspirations, aspiration is an integral part of how young people think about themselves today, right? And think about the fact that you have a generation that has grown up on, as part of a global culture, a very global culture, right? That their parents barely understand, right? And they, they want that to reflect in their choices. Um, the things we buy, the choices we make, it's some sort of like social signal into a large extent, right? And we want our choices to reflect and show the kind of cultures and societies we belong in. So people would decide not to choose a certain brand simply because it doesn't look good for their social groups, right? People, even though the brand is great, there is nothing wrong with the brand, but it's just bad social signaling for them. So that means that brands have to create a new, like a new perception of themselves because it will now help young people choose them, right? Um, so I, I, I think that that is one of the, single biggest factors that determine how people choose what brands to engage with. It's like, oh yes, quality is one thing, but how does this thing align? Like where does, what, where does this give me? What type of social standing does this give me aligning with this brand? 
And also, I think just just recommendations. Um, the way people choose things nowadays is is they go on their they go on Twitter and go, yo, who has a guy that does X Y Z? And it's whoever your TL recommends. That I mean, because if most of your TL is using it, that that means they're all right. Um, so there's the values, and I think for values for for something like in Nigeria, for example, there's been some unrest and people have pretty much highlighted and gone hmm these are some brands that supported xyz during these times we're going to make sure we support these people because they supported us during these times it's it's it might not reflect immediately but it's a conscious thing that people are now going ah so you're using these people instead of these people when we know that this particular brand was the one that spoke up it's a thing that we are going to start seeing recurring for a lot of things. There are people that will refuse to use something simply because um, the CEO or or somebody prominent or the brand itself is not seen to be women friendly. Do you get what I mean? Or they say something that you know for a fact that they are pretending to be women friendly, but the things that their press releases say suggest that perhaps they don't know what's this thing is about. So a lot of value, like there's a lot of value driven consumption happening um, and just recommendations. So there's social signaling, but definitely a lot of recommendations because I know even if I wanted a carpenter, <laughs> I would go on my, I would go online and say, who has a carpenter that they know is good? I wouldn't go, I don't know if there's a website, but I would, I would trust my TL more than I would trust the website, honestly. <laughs> yeah. What is TL? Twitter. <laughs> I'm up? aging myself. I'm aging myself. But I do have to ask because, you know, also the audience might, you know, I'm using the audience as an excuse now. Also, the <laughs> audience might not know what TL is. Okay. So, um, in, so you pump out a lot of content uh, from your company. And so you must see, you know, what works, what doesn't work. In creating engaging content, uh, targeting youth, what have you seen that worked and what did not? What what surprised you in your experience uh, in, in, in putting uh, content out there? I'm going to say how difficult it is to gain trust. And I'm saying this as a person that hasn't always worked in media. So um, before I worked in media, I used to be a tax consultant. Um, so um, I, I then upped and decided to try something different. But seeing it happen in real time, a few years ago, there was, Zikoko wasn't as popular or as on the tongue of people as it is right now. And there was a lot of just building the trust and doing the work, even though nobody is actually talking about it. So there's lots of, we like it. If we like it, people like us will like it. And let's just keep doing it until they do, which is kind of what happens and what maybe brands who are not in media don't have the time for or the range for, because you usually have KPIs where you're like, you have to get to 50,000 engagement XYZ by March. But for you to get to something by March, you probably need to have started the engagement and the work probably six months ago. Um, and so a flash sale or a flash something will get you some engagement, but won't get you sustained brand load. And I think finding out how difficult it was to build that trust has been pretty enlightening on my end. Because before I was on the other side, I was just like, you know, you write cool things and people will come to you. Um, but seeing the strategy behind all of that has been has been pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. So now let's talk about Naira Life. Where okay. you put your stories about okay. young people and money. What are some of the astonishing facts you learned about young people's attitudes towards money uh, in publishing that series? I, I think the first thing is that we don't understand money, right? We don't know how it works. Um, um, growing up, for most for most young Africans, um, you realize that um, parents don't allow you to engage with money, right? They don't they don't share their money problems. So you grow up and you just assume that your father and your mom are the richest people in the world, until you run into other people that clearly have more money than your family, and then you now start to realize, oh wait, like 
like it's like you're confronting a new world, right? Um, and one one thing I find interesting is that for most of I think we have a bit of a connection challenge. Okay. Before I, I, I think okay, please, please, please continue. Okay. okay. You you realize that one one interesting thing I've learned is that people who start engaging with money as teenagers generally make make better financial decisions than people who started as um like as adults, right? Because they have some experience. They they they've made the mistakes early. Um. So I think the first thing, the most the first interesting thing is that we don't understand money how it works. We don't understand how to keep it, how to grow it. Um, so, for example, now people are obsessed with um, saving, right? And many people don't realize that saving your money is not essentially the safest thing to do with all your money, right? So, I think that there's a, there's a huge gap that is almost impossible for one block to fill, and that gap is the education gap. Like people just don't understand money. Um, some people use the advantage, like just by not educating them enough, you can use, um, you can, um, they take advantage of people and use, sell products to them that, um, of course, like ignorance. But when you want to say, sustain a like loyalty over a long period of time, right? If if a brand is playing the long game, a brand has to understand that sometimes making the best decision for a customer for a user might not necessarily mean making a sale now. Right, and uh, it's, it's difficult to convince your boss that, um, hello sir or hello ma, um, I, I I did not make a sale, but I, I got us some brand law. Right, it's quite tricky when you have um, quarterly reports and to to, to kind of contribute to, um, but it, with most with a lot of brands that have, that have done that financials in most sectors, you've, we've seen pay off right over the last decade, um, so. Um, education is a problem, it's a serious problem, um, and anybody that can successfully educate young people about how to use money can get them to do anything, period. Very cool. And so, in terms of, I mean, we just talked a little bit about money from the perspective of saving it or investing it. Uh, yeah. What about moving it around? Payment services such as fund transfers, uh -huh. remittances, yeah, bill payments, merchant payments. I was going to talk, was gonna talk okay. about that. Um, sure. uh, there's, like I said, there's people earning money in so many different types of ways right now. Um, it's no longer the traditional go to the office, get a salary on the 24th or 25th. There's people that are. Um, their boss is not in Nigeria. They work for a company abroad, but they've just decided to be here. There's remote work of all kinds. And one of the biggest problems has been just getting getting paid. Um, people are always asking, yo, which, which link should I use to get my payment? How can I pay you? Oh, this service is not available in your country, so we have to do a bank transfer. And if we do this type of transfer, you have to take some of the charges. You have to bear some of the cost. And so just moving, I think the same way it is Herculean to move human beings around Africa, we are finding that it is Herculean to move money around. I mean, for Naira Life, for example, there, there was one, and I don't have it up here yet, where there was a fellow working in Nigeria, but he's from Niger, and he has to send money to his family in Niger um, every couple of weeks. Just the logistic is a nightmare. <laughs> and so there's, there's, there is money to be made in figuring out how to make sure people can move money around Africa, how to make sure that um, it accommodates the work of a remote worker who makes, who gets payments every two weeks or every day of one week because they have, they're working on different remote projects. Um, definitely, definitely something, there's something there to be had um, for people looking to provide services. Yeah, definitely, definitely a need. That's a uh, very useful insight for us to hear because, you know, we're a bank that are in 33 African countries. So uh, we've experienced, we experienced the, the movement around 
uh, as a person who likes to travel, I've seen how difficult it can be to move between African countries. Uh, and also, uh, you know, I, I do know that sometimes people do struggle with moving money. But fortunately yeah. for us, we do have lots of solutions that can resolve those issues. Now, um, talking about moving around, some of the audience are not aware about the Jalaf Road project. Please, can you speak about it? Yeah, I know, right? I mean, with all that work, all that you know, stuff that happened, can you speak about how you came to do this trip across West Africa? Share with us what motivated the trip, how you organized it, and more. Give us more in, into that, please. I'm going to say what happened, and then Fuad can say the cleanup version. Fuad, Fuad worked, um, he came into the office one day and he said, I'm going to go on a trip around West Africa. If you guys don't fund it, I will resign and go by myself. So make sure you fund it. And then he walked out of my office. <laughs> and that's, that is how he was like, this trip is going to happen. So make sure we find the money for it <laughs> to happen. And then we had to call him back and be like, okay, talk us through the actual logistics of why, what, what do we need? Um, but the way it started was a threat from Fuad saying, he was going to do this, and if we didn't support him, he was going to resign and do it anyway. And we like him around, so we found the support system for that. So, Fuad, you cannot tell the rest of the story. Anyway, is he? Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I th I think we we already hinted to some parts of it, right? Um, in in more ways. Um, than not, right? West Africa is in fact a country, right? Um, before like the colonial lines came and divided the entire region, like we spoke a lot of the same languages, we traded together, and it was just weird how, um, like I know more about, I used to know more about like New York as a city than I knew about any other West African country, and like you literally run into a stranger in um, in um, Liberia and you feel like you you might know this person from somewhere, right? Until you realize that they are actually from um, a county in Liberia and that's where their parents were born, right? So, so I, I think I, it, it, was, it was an exercise in curiosity to a large extent. It's like, okay, um, West Africa is many things, but like, like, what is West Africa? What are, who are West Africans, right? And another interesting thing that helped us to think about how to structure it is that we know that Nigerians, Nigerians are very bullish about how we think about our jello fries, right? But one thing we must all admit is that um, it came from Senegal, right? And it's interesting because it's, you, we definitely know you did not get here by plane. Um, so the question for us was, um, Jello fries traveled all the way from Senegal, the, the farthest mainland country um, in West Africa, all the way to Nigeria, across West Africa. And for us, it was like, what else traveled? So it was basically trying to find patterns and find the place, the ways we are alike beyond just our food and jello fries. Um, and that was that was actually that's literally why it's in jello fruit. Jello fruit is basically the way um, silk traveled across um, Asia. Um, and the Middle East, and it's like, oh, okay, yes, um, Silk Road, right? So it's like, oh, yes, Jollof traveled. Um, and, we, and we named it Jollof Road, pretty much. Very, very, very interesting. So, audience, please, if you have questions, you should start putting them in on the uh, Q&A. There's a Q&A, um, show Q&A um, sort of um, box on, on the menu. So please, uh, if you have questions, please put them in there because we will be taking questions uh, soon. Uh, all right, so let's get even further. I'm, I'm actually interested. This is a very fascinating trip. Um, I like jollof rice, and I'm not going to ask you which one is the best one because we already know the answer to that question. Um, but um, can you share with us some of the highlights and lowlights of your trip? I mean, I, I remember when you came to Lome, and um, you know we we went to a restaurant across from the port, and you were telling us about how. It was amazing that there was a port next door and there was no traffic, right? Uh, and that port actually does more uh, in terms of containers apparently than the uh, the one in Apapa in Lagos. Yeah. So, could you tell us a little bit about what was what did you see? What were some of the highlights and lowlights of the trip for you? 
Um, I th- I think the like the the most valuable part of the trip for me was was just the fact that we did not feel like strangers anyway, right? Um, maybe it's maybe it's it's our tendency to just be highly hospitable, but you run into people that give up. Seems like we we have a connect. Okay, uh, Fuad, your yeah, connection was poor. Please continue. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, something interesting happened in Ghana. That's my favorite. My my one of my best moments. Something interesting happened in Ghana where a random stranger never met him before, never heard of him before. He just sent me a DM on Twitter and he said, "I know you don't know me, but someone is made, someone is organizing a party in Accra this night, and I wanted to show up." And we were like, hmm, is this the day that <laughs> we go missing? Anyway, we showed up for the party and it was a Ghanaian who organized an Independence Day party for Nigerians in Ghana, right? And invited all our Nigerian friends and that's how we ended up there. And it was just complete strangers arguing over the love rice, arguing over electricity, like having the time of our lives. And... Um, I, I still like checking with some of the people that were in that room that night, and that is easily one of their best nights ever. Um, I think that, I think that was the that was the highest point for me. Um, there were other high points, but everything ju- was just a reflection of that in a, in a sense. Um, something interesting again. I mean, like it might look like a low point. But it wasn't actually a low point. And the low point is that um, we we had to, it was not even when, when I fell sick or when Turkey fell sick. It was when we had to travel from Guinea to Guinea-Bissau and we had to sleep in the bus. But something interesting even happened that night. Um, in the small town where we were, um, there was only one kiosk that was so bright and so lit and we entered in, into the kiosk and there was this guy, his name is Abdul and he's like 23 and he speaks French and we speak English and our internet was bad so we're trying to buy noodles and he's like he just hands me his phone and he's like yeah talk and we're using Google Translate basically um, that, like, that was an unexpected moment because it was in the middle of nowhere and he made, like we made a transaction, a transaction happened Right, um, and that just made me feel so good. Um, yeah, and he kept his shop open for us for an extra hour just so we could charge our stuff. So, yeah, best guy, Abdul. That's I, I don't even know. If I can't even say if they were low moments in the true sense of low moments because, um, yeah, okay. So, um, we're getting some questions, uh, from the audience. Uh, one about cost of travel through West Africa? How expensive was it to travel in terms of border control? And were there any aha moments, like something unplanned that happened? You just gave one example of something unplanned that happened, uh, but people are interested to know. I mean, I know you crossed a lot of borders, uh, but also yeah. just the costs in general of moving around West Africa as you did in the van. Please share. Um, so traveling across West Africa, interestingly, is not as expensive as many people think. I'll give you an example. Um, there's this town in um, in um, Senegal called Kaulak. Um, ar- um, around this period, um, Muslims that cross West Africa travel to Kaulak for like a, a mini pilgrimage of sorts. And I, I ran into like people who live in my neighborhood in Lagos, and they were saying they told me that it was a five day trip from Lagos to Kaulak, and it cost them seventy k. Right, um, the entire cost of it, like Naira. Naira. Okay. yeah, in Naira, and um, you realize that traveling by public transport is actually not so expensive across West Africa um, because the bus companies, for example, already understand how the borders work, they don't understand the borders that need bribes because they are borders that need bribes, um, and they, they, they all, all of that logistics. Um, is factored into the cost of transport, right? Um, so yeah, in, in fact, we ran into some, we ran into two people, two Lagosians in Senegal, who were also just traveling across West Africa on their own. And um, 
Like that was, that we also got feedback on them. We realized that they were extremely frugal, um, and they, they did at least five or six countries with less than um, less than four hundred thousand naira, right? And that that was quite interesting. Um, so I th- I think that cost is mostly a factor of how you choose to travel. Um, if you do not understand the borders well, best to just use public transport, right? Um, there are some countries where the borders are just easier than others. I think the best stretch, personally, I think the best stretch is from Lagos to um, Lagos to Cote d'Ivoire. That's the best stretch because it is just a straight road. It is just a very smooth process, except that Ghana border. But even that is mostly just a smooth process. Um, so yeah, um, I, 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 um, I on planned moment. On planned moment was Gambia. And it was the border official threatening to send us back because we did not show up with cash or some weird thing, right? It felt like one of those weird moments where um, um, they were trying to be like, do, do, who do you think you are? <laughs> oh, because you think you're Nigerians. Uh, and yeah, but yeah, that ended like very quickly. But yeah, um, it was, it, the borders were mostly smooth as, as, as far as I can remember. Okay. And they were smooth because sometimes we had to like just buy our time, <laughs> what we call bribes. Um, I, I think you learn that, you, you learn that it's, it's about time, like they have time, you don't, so you just buy time. Okay. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> no, I didn't go on the trip, so but I, I flew to Senegal to meet them and cost wise. I guess it depends really on how you like to travel. I like road trips, but I don't know if I can do this entire stretch um, by road. I would probably have liked to fly <laughs> and to not sleep in a bus. Um, so um, it probably depends on your luxury levels and how you like to travel. But there is a travel package for everybody, I think, is is the important thing. A lot of these stories are on are still on the website, jellofro.com, so you can go find out a few more about that. But yeah. Othal, back to you. Okay, so you know, you talked about travel packages. It's interesting mm-hmm. to um, figure out how you found the information about where to stay, what to do, uh, you know, how were you able to get all that? Uh, you know, because you went to some very obscure places. Uh, so, please share. A lot of, a lot of it was crowdfunded, like the way people, um, people would just say, "Oh, you're in X country, you should definitely see." So again, it's about going back to your TL. What we talked about earlier about how young people interact and how they get information. There's not one website that has all of this. There's no travel star or something that says you should definitely go to Senegal and see the big statue in the middle. There's none of that. It was, a lot of it was crowdfunded. Um, I will say there are some places we had marked down. Um, Fuad is a big fan of Airtable and sheets and spreadsheets. So there are some places we had marked down, but there's nothing, if you're going to show the essence of Africa, you obviously want to make it as local as possible. And I have to say a big thank you to like the readers and people that watched all the videos on YouTube. They're still there, go see them. And it was just mostly crowdfunded. People would invite them for random things and they would message me. I would be in Lagos going, oh my God, please don't die. And they'd be like, yeah, somebody just messaged us that there's X, Y, Z, so we're going. See you later. <laughs> and then two hours later, they come back. I'm like, yeah, it was good. Um, so a lot of it was very crowdfunded, or the way it seemed from my end, um, from the office. So, okay, so crowd crowdsourcing essentially, crowdsourcing of uh, of information. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. So frankly, um, I I think it starts with just searching online. Um, um, I I think that we also have this general skepticism about Africa and and what is available, right? Um, a lot of the information was already online. Um, in, in, in fact, the the people element is just for the sake of trust. It's like having people like just tell us what they think about these places. 
So for, for many of the countries that we entered, um, um, besides, I mean, an integral part of, of helping us navigate some countries was that we had Ecobank people waiting for us and um, promising us that they were going to outdo the previous country, which was an interesting thing to just be the person that everybody's trying to, ah, okay, you want to outdo this? Nice. How about we have like states? Yeah. But yeah, let's focus now. Um, so um, a lot of it was, was just research and crowdsourcing. But for me, okay. Another connection challenge uh, for what? Yeah, it's come back. Okay. So, yeah, so because we went to all of these places, our way of documenting all of this for now is just like writing journals on jellofro.com, right? Um, chances are it will evolve and how people engage with jellofro.com will evolve, but where it is now is that it is a journal of every country we went to across West Africa. Um, what people are like, um, who, who, where the people are most, are the warmest, where people are the most hectic, um, the places where um, power is not a problem, where power is a problem. So it was like our daily life getting documented. It was, it felt, some of it felt so mundane at the time, but now it's in hindsight, it's just a valuable resource to help you navigate West Africa. Great. So question from Alex, um, from the audience. What was the biggest success of the Jollof Road journey? That it happened. <laughs> that it. For, for me as management and partnership, my biggest success is that it actually happened. Um, I I made, it was, Fouad called me like the mother hen on this trip, but I made them share their locations. I made them, I was tracking as they moved from country to country. And as soon as they got back into Nigeria, my sigh of relief could probably have been heard in Timbuktu. It was that it happened and that it was successful and that they left in one piece and came back in one piece. Probably the high, like, <laughs> highlight of my trip from a management perspective. There's other cool things, but if you ask me, just make it, it was a Herculean thing. Literally two weeks before the trip happened, we were not sure if we were going to go. It was still, oh my God, we have this other thing to happen. And then the bus hasn't, and then it all just clicked. So that it happened was, yeah, I'm going to be talking about it for a long time. <laughs> Definitely. So I, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, I think the success for me and what will continue to perpetuate itself, like in a sense for the next few years, I imagine, um, uh, is that before we even got back, people were already beginning to ask the question of, well, oh, how can I do my own job of road? Like, like, where do I start? Where do I go? What do I need? Um, and as, as young people become more prosperous, hopefully over the next few years, hopefully, right? We are going to see more of that. We're going to see more people wanting to just explore and make the most, get like more, more experiences out of life. And the first places they're going to look are the places closest to them, right? Um, it's like every other week, Toki or um, or me or Kade is getting a message about, oh, I, I'd like to go to this place. Like, where should I go? As like yesterday, I saw Toki on Twitter replying a message about the best coast, the best beach to go on a budget where there is no security problems and all of that. And it, and it's, it's, it's just that. Um, it, I think the goal for me, the success for me is that we've, we've started to define a culture of leisure travel across West Africa um, and, and kind of create an identity for it of sorts. Um, yeah, so that, 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 that is what I would consider the biggest success for me. I, I, I mean, I'm not worried about life and, and yeah, as Chidi was. Which is which is obvious, which is <laughs> which is expected, um, but yeah, like we didn't die, like <laughs> so. Uh, thankfully, thankfully. So uh, another question uh, from the audience: Do you think that West Africans would be interested in traveling beyond West Africa to countries in East or Southern Africa? Yes, um, a lot of it is already happening. Um, 
a lot of it. Uh, we have we have some friends of Zikoko who are who are constantly organizing trips across like these pockets of places, um, East Africa, um, even in South Africa. Just trips like Nigerians just want to get like young people generally urban young people want to get more out of like their lives and out of their experiences without having to worry about visa problems because for example now um, you want to go to a country and you have all even if you have all the money you might not have, you might not have the visa to get in but for like for most of africa for most african countries especially in east africa for example where there is and uh, minus equas where there is um a like there's an east, east african visa that takes you across like three east african countries at least like those things make people want to do it more. It just it drops the prices for people. Um, so yeah, um, there is definitely a culture of people already doing that, and I I believe we're going to see more of it in the coming years when everybody stops being extremely scared of coronavirus. Of course, the yeah. obvious coronavirus. That's true. I know here we are talking about travel, and uh, <laughs> there are some restrictions right now, but you know, times will will change at some point. Um, another question from the audience, this person is a big fan of Huai, he says, we live in a revolving world of how content is developed and disseminated. Zikoko and Tekabao can acclimatize due to the, in your industry segment. How can the financial industry tap into this growth and create a dynamic youth base without losing its core value of profitability? Um. So, I mean, like, I think I think there's a there's a broad word for this, and we call it content marketing. Um, but I really think that we we spoke about this to an extent earlier. Um, I think the priority, as you said earlier, too, is trust. Once you can get your audience to trust you genuinely, not trust you, and then you now scam them later. Like you get them to genuinely trust you, right? Um, they are going to buy anything you take. One of my favorite examples of brand trust is and brand love is Netflix. Netflix recommends, like Netflix on social media, recommends non Netflix shows for people to watch and tell you, oh yeah, it's on HBO. It's not on Netflix, but it's on HBO, right? When people ask them, like, oh, do you have this show on Netflix? And they're like, no, we don't have it. It's on HBO. You can watch it here. That kind of stuff. And now what that does is that anybody following netflix knows that whenever netflix recommends a thing for them it is it is just the best possible thing that exists um, in the context of um financial industry and, and, and money making um i th i think that um like I, I i one of my oldest memories of my mom and the banking sector is about her taking a loan that she did not have a full knowledge of she did not understand every like all the consequences of the loan. So it was like it was like she did money rituals, and after she said that um, she didn't want to do it again, they said, "Okay, you are going to run mad after seven market days." Um, so she it, it it felt like she walked into a trap, right? And I feel like many customers also feel like that with financial services, especially. Um, I but I think what will make brands stand out over the next decade is um, trust. It's just how can we create the best possible experience for our users? And it is not just um, it is not just the nice banking halls. It is also just like a bank that listens to people and understands that their needs are very, very unique. Um, of course, on the back end of things, on the analytics end of things, as a, if you work in financial sectors, you realize that most people are part of a, part of a subset or a group of people. But when you make people feel like they are the only ones that matter, um, they will, like they will just do anything for you. And sometimes that will mean educating them on what are their, what their best choices are. Um, that, would, that would mean um, figuring out how to share some of the risk with them. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like you understand the financial sector better than I do, right? But I, I, I guess some of that education can come from the R&D budget, um, uh, which every big establishment should have. So yeah, um, trust, just focus on building trust. That's, that's a fair enough thing. Um, another question, and you had spoken about 
urban youth earlier, and there's a question about where does the rural youth, this is from Carl, where does the rural youth feature in this narrative? Um, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. Um, so I, I think that um, a, a, a key element of what will save our future, like what will help us secure our future on this continent, is figuring out the easiest ways to create, the, the quickest and easiest ways to create some um, prosperity across even rural communities, right? I mean, it's like, um, take for example, the guy I used for example, um, Abdul in Cumbia. Cumbia, it took us, it took us six hours of mud. To get to, um, no, no, 10 hours. It took us another six to eight hours to get to another um, country because we did not see towns anywhere. But this is a guy in the middle of nowhere, right? Uh, with who was using like Google Maps, uh, I mean Google Translate to make a transaction. And the question is that um, what are the ways that we can take prosperity to these places? I, 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 I have a bias, but um, and yeah, I'm, I'm pretty bullish about it that the single most important thing that we can do for people is figure out how to get internet to the most remote places, one, because that solves the education problem. And when the internet gets there, what are the easy, like lo-fi ways that we can create opportunities for people to earn more money? Because um, take for example, um, with agency banking, right? I know that um, there are some places in Liberia, right? Where um, they are completely cut off from, from the rest of the country when, during the rainy season because of the mud problem in Liberia and the infrastructure problem in Liberia. But in some of these places where people are cut off, right? They can still make mobile money transactions, right? So it's like, how, what, what are the ways to carry, um, to carry prosperity to these rural places? I think um, phones are going to be an integral part of it because phones are an essential part of people's lives already. Um, and you just need to build on top of that infrastructure. And um, um, in the future, of course, there's the, it's, it's, it's not a question of the internet. Um, but I, I, I really think the, the, again, the priority is um, education and um, and prosperity. Um, in the in the in in the the question as it relates to leisure travel and all of that, yeah, like my not my claim not be a priority right now because globally it's not really a mindset you expect expect from people not living in urban areas. People in urban areas trying to travel and look for experiences because they're trying to unplug from the hectic life. Hectic, hectic city life and all of that. But yeah, um, I, I think that the priority for me with rural areas is yeah, prosperity and education. Figuring out how prosperity can get there cheaply. Thank you, Fuad. Uh, I see a question from Aisha. Does Ecobank offer any services that allow for groups of young people to save for trips? So that would be a question that I would need to answer. Uh, yeah. I would say that uh, the answer to the question is, yes, we do have um, savings products, a variety of savings products that allow you to save for a trip. Um, to do so as a group, that I think we, we might need to look into that. And I, I think that, um, you know, just like Chidi had said earlier, uh, listening to what people are asking for, if it is something that people are asking for, that we would like to have some kind of group saving among ourselves uh, to um, save for a trip, then it's definitely something that we have the capability to offer. And so uh, look, watch the space for that. Um, then another question, this one from Cisse, do you mind sharing the transportation network you used for your trip? Um, okay, so the sixth yeah. member of the trip was a boss, we call, we, a boss called Black, and Black was our, our ride or die, our bumblebee. Um, um, and of course, we traveled by road, like completely by road, except that one time or one or two times where we, you know, like three or four times that we had to travel by, we had to ferry our bus across like a river or something, Guinea to Guinea Bissau, because there is no road connecting Guinea to Guinea Bissau. Through Basically, um, the bus was um, GIGM's contribution to the trip. Yeah. Um, the bus, the driver, so the driver also was 
a stand up stand up guy that knew most of the roads. I think up until we got to um, Cote d'Ivoire, um, yeah. we um, the team for Zikoko did not use uh, public transportation. Although Fuad threatened me that he would indeed use public tra transportation if I did not get him a bus. Um, so I went to go and beg GIGM. But um, the bus is GIGM's bus and it's the bus they use for almost all their trips around um, West Africa and, and within Nigeria. So yeah, um, we did that and we were able to brand it. Um, so everybody knew the bus um, as we went around um, on this trip. So I hope that... I bounced by everybody knowing the bus. She did figure out what he said. I remember I was entering Guinea-Bissau and some random guy just came and said, oh, you guys are here already. <laughs> it was it was a little, it was as exciting as it was creepy. You guys like, ah. Yeah. Um, I, he had been expecting us, so yeah. Oh, you guys are here already. I'll never forget I that. With um, the question, I know there's people that do trips. Um, if you're planning a trip, I know GIGM goes up until Ivory Coast, I think, and then you can then find other bus transportation for the rest of the trip. It's entirely possible by, um, most of the trip is entirely possible by road. There are a few bad spots that you probably do not want to be on the road for. Um, so not sure what context your question was in, but ours was a bus um, given to us by GIGM, but you can totally replicate the trip using local um, bus transportation systems. Which I highly recommend. Okay. Um, Osama, back to you. Sure. So, and a question from Hussein. Is there a plan to open trips like this up to the public? The Jalof Road, but not with only Zikoko or about folks, but to the public, open to the public? We're thinking about it. Um, in the nature of listening to people um, when they ask you questions, we have gotten this question um, a number of times. We have, and even when we were going on the trip the first time, the way it was originally planned, we were going to have people from outside the Zikoko team, but we thought let's do it ourselves and kind of know all the possible ways in which this trip could go right or wrong. And then, you know, if Echo Bank is game, we, we'll figure out a way to, <laughs> to make it happen. Um, but it's something we've, we've thought about. The logistics of it all means we're not a travel company, obviously, and making sure that people are comfortable when they travel means that we have to ensure that they don't sleep in a bus. Um, <laughs> um, so it might be a bit more tricky, but once we figure out the kinks of that, you'll probably hear from us, Hussein. Okay, yeah. thanks for that. And um, yes, it, you know, just like you're not a travel company, we're not a travel company either. Um, but what we do provide is um, payment solutions and, and um, banking solutions across the whole of Africa, or should I say middle Africa, uh, which can be very useful. I don't know if, uh, Fouad, if you want to talk about anything you experienced in terms of uh, making payments or, or handling money, because you had to handle money throughout this whole trip. Do uh, you have any comments about that? I remember our conversation in Lumi that night. Where, when we're talking about um, like the infrastructure that exists already, the financial infrastructure that exists with EcoBank, and like it was absolutely ridiculous to me that um, that I did not already know it before because it's like we could actually send money from like I think I think so I feel like these technologies right. Because we have access to them every time, it's so easy just as if, oh yeah, this is how the entire world works. But we're like we're using Nigerian accounts to scan and pay for food in Liberia. I think that was the first mad part, right? Because when we entered, when we entered um, um, Kotonou, for example, we're like. There's one picture here where we we're excited to change money with local money changers and everything and, and all of that. And then we just realized that we got lazy about looking for um, like broadly change people to exchange the money because um, at almost every border where there were actual human beings, except the except the remote borders, like 
the extremely remote ones, there was an access, there was there was a, an Echo Bank ATM there. Um, I think, and it, it it now became a thing of like there was a constant sigh of relief, like oh yeah yeah we'll, yeah there, don't worry there'll be there'll be an Echo Bank ATM there, right? And then we got to the point that I didn't have an Echo Bank ATM, and we're like, okay. But <laughs> interestingly, when we entered Guinea Bissau, the first bank we encountered was Echo Bank. Um, and that was that was that was quite comforting, right? Beyond the fact that yeah, Echo Bank sponsored this trip, and we are you know like saying stuff about Echo Bank. That was very reassuring to just see. It was like it was like running into your country's embassy, in a sense, right? Um, so yeah, I think I think I think the creative ways we could pay was an interesting part for us it was because it was it was quite revealing we ran into our friends from nigeria like some other people from nigeria when we ran into them in senegal i actually sat in the bank with them for one hour 20 minutes to withdraw money from western union while we were we, we are just been just been going to atms and withdrawing like sport brats right um, <laughs> we're actually sports to a large extent like um but i think money across west africa is generally very very interesting right um i i think that for us, it felt to a large extent like one currency because we just we just optimized for um, for available gateway um, payment gateways that we could trust. Um, so we're experimenting with um, with agents, with money agents, with um, a, like there were ATMs everywhere, right? We just withdrew, right? And our, our lives were mostly easy, frankly. I feel like we did not get enough of the difficult experiences that can educate people and say oh don't do x don't do y because we're doing only one thing which is just using echo bank atm and and swipe yeah so yeah i think i think i feel like i feel like we're a little too sports in that regard so i, I don't know if i have any wise things to say like oh when you're in this country don't do x oh don't do x right um but yeah I, I I really don't know what it would have looked like if we if we did not like have those cards, basically our our um, debit cards. Okay, and for you back at home, uh, monitoring everything, uh, Chidi, what was yeah. that experience like for you in terms of uh, handling of that stuff? It was mostly seamless, you know. It was a uh, big. All they did was make demands. They were like, "Oh, so we're running out of money now. So make sure you send." <laughs> That was the thing about us. That's that's the way it seemed from the office. It was just like so the money you sent to us is finished. Uh yes, we went clubbing with these Ghanaians and we did this other thing. So we need money now and we need to send this before tomorrow. And it's like, okay, great, cool. Um, it was it was I think it was um, reassuring to know that the first few times we tried it, I think our hearts were in our mouth. Which was, we just, did you get it? Did you get it? But after a while, it became a thing of, don't stress us. Like, it's a simple, it's a transfer. We will make the transfer. Stop. <laughs> um, so yeah, on our, on our end from the Lagos end of, of things, it was, it was, it was good to be able to be sure that their biggest problem was not that they wouldn't have money to, for, for, for um, basic necessities. Um, it was it would be stuff just local to the country but money was taken care of so yeah okay. um, yeah we're just to see you all <laughs> to see echo back everywhere yeah our biggest problem was probably internet i think maybe if there was a transaction that couldn't go through it was that the local internet was slowing slowing our was basically killing our joy um but yeah okay so Fuad, um, Demi Lade asks the question, did you really hold those live snakes? He thinks, maybe, the person probably thinks it was film trick. Uh, yeah. Did you really hold those live snakes or was that film trick? I had a fear snake that. <laughs> I had a fear snake that. I was, I was, I almost disgraced my ancestors. But I carried those snakes. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, see, I am I am terrified of snakes. I like I don't watch if I if I see snake videos online, like if if I watch if I watch a snake video on Twitter right now, I'm going to put my legs up 
on my chair because there, there just might be a snake under the chair. Like what are the, like that's how terrified I'm of snakes, right? But I carry the snakes. They are ball pythons and they are mostly those uh, they just eat rats. That's what they said. That's what they said. And I trusted them, right? Because but I carry the snakes. There's nothing anybody can tell me. Like, pretty docile. I've been to Wida and I've been to that temple. Um, they're pretty chill. Um, so if you're planning on going, you should definitely go go to that temple. Um, the priests are nice, and the snakes are pretty docile and actually feel like they want to be carried or So you'll be fine. <laughs> okay. I don't um, know that. Lion thing. No, I can't I decide. Lion thing. The lion thing is a bit more heroic, but um. <laughs> I would do the snakes and avoid the lions. <laughs> <laughs> so the lion, the lion part is quite interesting because those lions are trained, like they were raised in like, um, in like I don't know, I don't know the English for it, but in like the controlled wild, in quotes. Um, and the reason why we have to hold on to those staffs is because those are the staffs they were trained with, and they were trained that the training is that these staffs are symbols of authority and like. Um, as long as we're holding the staff, nothing was going to happen, happen to us. I mean, it would have been like a fun experiment to just drop it and see what happens. But those lions are huge. Um, those lions are very huge. Um, so we just we just held on tightly. So I'm holding mine with two hands, as you can see, um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people think that lions are the size of dogs, perhaps, but they are hey. actually not. They are hey. not. They are much larger. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. All right. So, question from someone else on the uh, in the audience: Can you share some light on countries with less issues with visas in Africa? Again, I I think you might have you were traveling within West Africa. Maybe you can tell them about the, you know, visa or passport issues, if any. Yeah. Um, so across West Africa, um, you just you just need your Equus passport. Um, you, like your Equus passport is like your father's country. You just enter and like, yeah, I'm 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 West African. Like, so there's very little problem across West Africa. I also know about um, East Africa. There's an East African visa that gives you access to, um, I think, Kenya, um, Uganda, and Rwanda. Um, um, it's like a 30 day or 90 days, I can't remember now, but it's, 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 it's relatively affordable. Um, I, I don't know about much of the rest of West Africa. I know, for example, that the South African um, visa office in Lagos always has long queues and a lot of rejections. Um, I know that there are a ton of other West African countries that have, like Mauritius, for example, has a 90 day, um, 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 visa on arrival thing, you just show up with your spending power and your desire for enjoyment and they allow you to stay for 90 days in your country. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think I think there is some research to be done. Like just, if you really want to travel, there are a lot of resources online to just guide you. Uh, Makesh, I feel like we have a thing or two about that in Spoko. But if you just want to travel, there are, there are places where you can actually just go that don't cost so much. They're not as expensive as Schengen, for example. And you, you have a good time. And if you're West African, you have 14 countries or 15. We didn't go to Wannabe. You have yeah. at least 14 countries to go to um, where you don't need a visa and you don't like, you don't, no visa fee, no nothing. You just go with your ECOWAS passport and, um, and a pride. That's it. <laughs> and you're let in for uh, three months, I believe. Don't overstay leave after that but um you have at least 14 countries to explore um before you explore the rest of africa i guess yeah okay. that's that's helpful <laughs> another question this one i think you have sort of covered it but let me just say if, if there's anything in there how do you deal with the different currencies and foreign exchange rates and do you use travel cards uh, Anonymous, I'm sorry to let you down, right? Um, but I don't know. I, I just see like the only card we had was we had, we just had our Echo Bank debit card. So I don't know what the travel card is. I just know that I put my card in an ATM and it gave me money. 
I put like my Nigerian account, I put it inside an ATM in um, um, Lume and it gave me francs. I put it in Ghana and it gave me CDs. I put it in Liberia and it gave me US dollars, right? I don't know about travel cards. I just know that I put my debit card that is active in Lagos inside ATMs across the region and it was vomiting money. Um, so forex rates, currencies, eh, not too much. And what you what you realize, I think, with the with the charges is that when when you are going to be on the road for a long time, right? The numbers they, like they start to they start to matter less and less because we realize that what we were losing in um, in um, in exchange just just. There was never a case of worry that maybe someone gave us fake money, or oh, because we know that an ATM is only only good money. Um, so I, I think I think that um, it, it felt like a valuable, it felt valuable and useful to us because we didn't have to worry about other elements of trust. So yeah. Okay. So looking back now, what are some of the key takeaways from the project you would like to share, and what could EcoBank do better? Um, I, I, I think also I, I, I feel like TD has many things you want to say, but I feel like the one thing I've been saying is that like what EcoBank has in 33 countries is what some startups have celebrated for having in five or six countries, right? Um, it's like I just want everybody to know what is possible, like with the sandbox, for example, right? With I know someone, someone just yesterday, just someone just one company just celebrated that they're about to launch transactions from Nigeria to Ghana, right? And like that already exists. And I feel like the key takeaway is figuring out the ways to get people people to understand what is possible, right? Um, People want to buy books from Senegal or pay for things in Senegal. Like, what are their options? I think it's a lot of the it's speaking to the audience in this language, not in language of um, the best bank across Africa, um, the most distributed bank across Africa, but the language of you want to send money to Senegal, done. Like you realize that they don't even, like they don't even care about where you are. They just care that they have a need and it is met. Um, I th I think that also I think that um, key takeaways um, is that the the like the demographic is very restless. It's a very restless demographic um, with a lot of aspirations. And I think one thing that's important for Access Bank beyond just even um, like serving them, providing financial instruments for them and all of that. It is understanding what those aspirations are and finding a way to communicate those aspirations, like Echo Bank's offerings to them with those aspirations. A good example is someone to organize um, trips, group trips and save, and like savings plans. That feels like a very, very, very small, small like feature tweak. And it like it's 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 it is the underlying infrastructure is probably just basic tech for the IT team at Ecobank. But for the person who can now save as a group, it is everything. Right. Um so I I, th I think there is a try a trifecta there with the product teams, the customer support teams who are constantly receiving all the feedback and the marketing team who are constantly telling people, Oh, these are the new things that we have, these are the things you should try. Um yeah. All right, and, and Chidi? Um, a lot of the same. Um, from, from my end, from the partnerships end, um, when we were doing this trip, it was, okay, map out all the countries we're going to go to, and then what do we need? We need a bus, we need money, we need blah. And so for us, when it came to the money bits, what I did was I went on all the websites of a lot of financial institutions, and I went, where are they located? And we 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 had like i still have that diagram echo bank was in all the countries we wanted to go and so it became a kpi for me that we had to get i mean you know this more than everybody and i now that the trip is done i can i can be shameless and say like we came to echo bank a couple of times and this took a while before we were like 
you guys are literally everywhere. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Like, you need to be on this trip because we can show young people that, like, we won't have to lie. We won't have to obfuscate and say, oh, there was one country they weren't in and for that we had to use Western Union. It's literally, you have the technology and the ability to make people's lives easier as they travel or do business. And I think you need to proud your proud basically <laughs> you, you need to tell everybody and tell everybody in a language that they will understand because we got that question a lot like if you check our timelines and, and check with the hashtag jollof road i believe lots of questions were either about has the bus broken down yet and it did not and that was kudos to um the gigm team but also oh my god how are they getting money and all we like we didn't have to cook up stories you know, it was just, yeah, they got, they said they got us and they did. That's, that's it. Um, so definitely speaking to people in languages that they will understand. Now, when I say language, not like English, Pidgin and Yoruba, whatever, but like in scenarios that they can place themselves in. And they're like, yeah, I should totally do that. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed, if it's, if it's not obvious, <laughs> I uh, we enjoyed working with uh, we enjoyed working with Ecobank quite a bit. Yeah, great stuff. Yes, we enjoyed working with you too. It's quite an exciting trip. Very very interesting uh, insights along the way. Okay, so we're coming to the end, and uh, it doesn't seem like there are any further questions on the Q and A. So let me just ask one last one to both of you. In closing, please share any thoughts you would like for the audience to reflect on. I think once Corona is over, you should you should travel. Um, you should be curious enough to find out what's going on outside Lagos um, and outside Nigeria. If you're if you're, I've assumed a lot of people are in Lagos, but I know Nigerians sometimes they either travel too much or they don't travel <laughs> at all and stay only where they grew up. You should be curious, always curious, and definitely travel, definitely. Start planning your next trip <laughs> and then tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's I, it's not a reflection thing, it's just find out what you're curious about awesome. and another country and find out how they deal with those things. Definitely travel, please. <laughs> that's it for me. That's it for me. For what? Okay, for what? I think for me, it, it's that. Um, there is, there is really no better time for us to begin to understand who we are. And this is not as one of those, like, very deep and woke things of oh, who I am, like, emo, emo stuff. It is just understanding that, like, the only people we truly have um, is us. And the first step is just understanding our neighbors and understanding the opportunities that exist here. Um, I, 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 I've, I've run into in, in the past few weeks. I've run into a lot of a lot of um, Lagosians who have said that oh, they want to, they don't mind relocating to Ghana, right? And you realize that for some people, the, migration is never a question of um, of looking for greener pastures. Like it is just a question of like just living a better quality of life. And by understanding where it exists, like in Africa, across West Africa, we find that it is even cheaper in some cases than the entire logistics of having to leave the continent. This is not a deterrent from JAPA, just so we are clear. Uh, it is just that, um, JAPA, uh, it is just that um, you, you just realize how much you do not know when you start to just explore these places. Um, I just saw an interesting question. Oh yeah, um, about the language gap. Um, sure, speak to it. Okay, so I think this was this was jarring. This was extremely jarring. Um, it was jarring because I mean we had Tosi on the trip who who speaks better French than English, even though she was born in the Bada. Um, um, but we. It became evident how jarring it is when we went to Guinea Bissau, where the only thing the only thing any of us knew was obrigado. Um, 
I think I think language is clearly in what you said for context. Guinea Bissau speaks Portuguese, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I I think that we we actually communicated, right? Um, communication happened. Business can happen across West Africa, even with the language barriers, because that's been happening for decades. We have a lot of people from that come from Mali and Niger. If you have um, family who used to sell stuff like in market, sell fabrics, you know they've traveled to all these countries where people speak French and all of that. So I, I think that um, some 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 work has been done, but I I think I think that even just coexisting and understanding our neighbors, we realize that. Once we say the most important things that need to be said, we can still have a good time with each other, even when we understand each other's language. And it happened over and over again. Um, people went to people actually turned on um, a in a French speaking country and did nothing happened. Um, yeah. So um, I th I think I think there are some parts that yes, Google, Google Translate can solve. There are some that is just basic human decency and hospitality just covers the rest. So yeah. Um, right. I see. I saw. I just saw a threat, but I'm going to just pretend I did not see it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we. I think we've come to the end of this. Um, what you call it? This discussion. And I would just like to thank you both for giving up some time to engage the audience on these topics. Uh, so thank you, Chidi. Thank you, Fouad, for your participation today. It has been very, very interesting content, uh, which I, I believe it was recorded, and so we can always go back and look at it. And um, I think there's a lot of learning that came out of it. So thank you both for joining, and I look forward to um, seeing you sometime uh, soon. All right. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in and staying with us um, through all of this. Enjoy the rest of your public holiday if you're in Nigeria and get back to work if you're not in Nigeria. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, Senegal, enjoy public holiday. I imagine it's public holiday in Senegal. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.